Good evening. Welcome to our Commemorative Air Force Warbird Tube webinar for this evening. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and we're glad you could join us. This uh, webinar series is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force, and if you uh, would like to support our mission to educate, inspire, and honor, you can do so by joining as a CAF member or by uh, making a donation. For more information on how you can support CAF, see a list of our aircraft, our units, and upcoming events, just visit our website, commemorativeairforce.org. Now tonight, if you have any questions during our presentation, just type them in the chat box, or if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube in the uh, in the uh, comment section, and we'll save some time at the end to get those questions answered. So right now, joining us from historic Wendover Field, Landon mm -hmm. Wilkie, Jim and Tom Peterson, and uh, gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, we were talking, uh, I guess, a couple of months ago about the history of Wendover Field, but uh, tonight's presentation is more about what's happened since and the restoration efforts that have, have gone into uh, making this a uh, wow a world class destination. I got a sneak peek of, of some of the uh, some of the work that you you gentlemen have done with all of your volunteers, and uh, it looks wonderful. So, take it away. Thanks, Steve. We appreciate uh, appreciate the opportunity to show you a little bit about about what's going on. <clears throat> it's a it's a huge project, and so we're we're kind of tackling things as we can, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll take it away. I'm now realizing please pardon our halos. I don't think we deserve them, but oh yeah, that's looks pretty great. <laughs> so we'll get started. Just for those who weren't able to attend the last one, we'll give a brief refresher on the history of Windover Army Air Base. There's a couple of our probably phone operators or some of our civilian employees by one of our base signs. So Wendover, Utah was founded in 1907 by the Western Pacific Railroad. Um, just a good place in the middle of the desert to take on water and coal for steam engines before they climb the mountains to the west heading into Nevada or before they cross the desolate salt flat and west desert heading into Utah. So about 1940, our population was a whopping 100 people. But within a couple of years, we really peaked at nearly 20,000 individuals as this base got up and running as a heavy bomber training base primarily. So here's just a decent overview of the base about 1943. You can see the extent of our runways, some to accommodate bombers for wind in any direction make it a little safer for these guys training with still so few hours under their belt. Wendover was a second base training base, or so we were involved in operational training units. So these guys already had their individual training. They came from all around the country to a base like Wendover. And then here, they were assigned to their air crew squadrons and groups. And within 90 days, they were supposed to be a self-sustaining combat ready unit and they'd pretty well deploy from here. Most of our guys going to the 8th Air Force in England. So there's just a good good and quick overview. That heavy bomber training went until early 1944, and throughout much of 1944, we did train the 72nd Fighter Wing with P-47 Thunderbolts, and then they got kicked out for a top secret mission you might have heard of as part of the Manhattan Project, and we were the training base for the B-29 crews, as well as the 509th composite group overall, and one of the final engineering phases for all non-nuclear components, something that the 216th Army Air Force Base Unit Special was doing out on the south base there on the bottom where they built over 150 prototype test shapes as we called them. So we never had nuclear material, but these guys were flying missions, learning how to drop the atomic mm -hmm. bombs from 30,000 feet, and then these prototypes were being tested to make sure everything else would function correctly when paired with that fissionable material. So that is a very quick overview just through World War II. Um, things died down pretty quickly afterwards. We were used kind of on and off as a training base for visiting groups because we still have a big bombing and gunnery range, now the Utah Test and Training Range to the east of us, and then had some special weapons testing and things kind of go on and off over the years but very little, very few stationed here after the war and just got quiet. So that's why a lot of the base got to the condition it did, as you'll see coming up. Take it away, Tom. Okay. Oh, sorry, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, 
<clears throat> yeah, we're, we'll be okay. So <clears throat> our, our objective on this base really <clears throat> is to restore it in a way so that when people come and walk onto the base, they can understand what it was like back in back in the 40s. There were 668 buildings total. We've got about 90 of the original structures left. We've got virtually the whole flight line left. There are six original hangars, uh, one burned down in 40, uh, 47, 46. But uh, uh, the hangars, the control building, the operations building right there. Uh, and so the flight line looks pretty original. And our whole objective is really to have people be able to walk in and see the barracks, the officers club, dining hall, squadron building, hangar, and really feel like they've kind of walked back onto an original base. <clears throat> so is that, are we into the before and after thing? Yeah. Yes, so, so um, we're gonna we're gonna just take a look at uh, a look at some of this uh, some of the buildings uh, that we've that we how we started with and where they ended up. This was the officers' club uh, when we first showed it showed up on it. Virtually every window was broken, as you can see. The inside was a total mess. <clears throat> and that's that's what it looks like today. After uh, actually after quite a quite an extensive restoration. There's the dance hall. Uh, there's a picture of the dance hall in the in the 40s. And there's the there's the dance hall as it looks today after our restoration. There's a picture of one side, and as you can see, there's there's a hanger or a <laughs> there's a singer standing right by the post. Uh, and but you saw in that pre that post right there. And now this singer is is standing there in the club, entertaining the troops in June fourth, or June of uh, forty four. And the club today, is, we've got uh, a number of photos. Memorabilia. There's a picture of the little boy atomic bomb. That's virtually an exact replica of the little boy and just giving you kind of a panorama of that of that dining hall the event hall area and so today the officers club serves as our primary museum on base so we have a number of rooms you're able to go through including the original bar and mess hall which we don't have a picture of in this slideshow so we're just trying to expand from here so there's even more for people to see and again, there's a there's a picture looking towards the southwest with the control tower. We have restored. Uh, I didn't put a picture of that in, but we've restored the interior of the control tower. Oh, you did. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, that's this is this is what it looked like when we first came and got into it. And here it is with the new floor. We restored the windows, and there's a photo uh, showing the World War II configuration. <clears throat> the barracks, we have a number of barracks left. The, most of them were taken out and sold right after the war for building materials, but uh, we still have three rows of barracks, uh, three columns of barracks, and we're working on restoring those. There's a photo, it's before paint. And here's a picture showing the iconic 
white painted rocks, which were used all over the base to identify where you could walk so you didn't walk on the grass, as you can see grass to the right and the left of those. There was a lot of that. There's the interior of a barracks, and there you go afterwards. So <clears throat> we've still got to put a couple of coal stoves into the barracks so that they uh, really show the show the true character of it. But that's uh, ultimately our our objective to have that. <clears throat> The Airman's Dining Hall, there's a before picture. <clears throat> uh, there's, a, there's a picture currently showing, uh, we were actually a little bit beyond this at this point, but we've got, got it painted and I have the uh, interior. It's been used quite a bit by the Civil Air Patrol, the Utah Wing. They have their annual encampments in uh, Wendover and actually the Nevada Wing now has come and had encampments in the in the dining hall. <clears throat> there's a picture of the serving line. And there's a picture of that very same serving line in uh, <clears throat> for Christmas in 1943. So we've been able to keep a great deal of this fairly original so that it has has that same same look and feel. Here's a picture of looking in the flight line today. <clears throat> looking up that building on the right is the fire station. <clears throat> Excuse me, during the war, that was actually the Bombardier training building. And right after the war, they added those uh, doors and that became the fire station. So in this picture, you can see again off to the right, you can see that Bombardier training building and these and these four guys walking towards the aircraft. Here's hangar number one, uh, which again used to be hangar number two prior to the 1946 fire. We have four of these wooden uh, hangars, the wooden squadron hangars that were. Oops. Why didn't we know? It's a good thing I've got Landon. <clears throat> so this, yeah, this is walking, or, or this is driving down the flight line. There's, that's the original control and operations building, which was again connected to the control tower. Driving down a little further are C-123 that was used in the filming of the movie Con Air, and they left it behind. Hangar number two. Here we have a squadron operations building. The squadrons could use those for their briefing and their training missions, planning a mission. Hangar three, another squadron operations building. Hangar four is the worst of the four. It's currently being restored. The doors are off of that hangar. This is the only new building on the flight line. That tan building uh, houses our ARF crash truck. And hangar number five has been restored, and the National Guard is using that. Another squadron operation building. And of course, here's that picture of the fire station that you saw earlier. The small building is the Norton Bombsite Storage Vault. It has five vault doors inside there. And of course, the big B-29 hangar. Back through, and then at the end, or at least when this video was recorded, we recently acquired last year a C-54 Skymaster built in 1945, and this is going to be one of our other restoration projects in addition to buildings on base. These are the before and after. <laughs> yeah, so here's... <laughs> This is kind of what it looked like when I first showed up on this base years ago. There uh, literally was just pretty much junk everywhere. Anyway, that was a before, here's an after picture. 
One of the notable things about Hangar 3 is I'm guessing many of you have seen the film Independence Day. In front of this hangar is where Bill Pullman, playing the president, gave his famous speech before they took off to fight the aliens. And actually tucked inside, they built up an office space. And that was also the underground entrance to where the aliens are on base. So not only is this Wendover Air Base, this is Area 51. And there's an earlier photo from the 40s, a squadron posing in front of one of their squadron hangars on a B-17. This was pretty typical of the bomb groups <clears throat> that uh, trained in Wendover. When they had their graduation, or when they were getting ready to head out, they posed these planes and everybody would stand on the wings or sit under the plane and take these huge group photos. So that's that's kind of typical of the of the base at that time. The, this, is, uh, this is just the kind of junk that was around the base when I showed up. Uh, many, of the, many of the hangars had just been used as uh, put, put things in there, abandon it, walk away. And uh, <clears throat> I think when we finally ended up after, uh, after about six or seven years of cleanup, I think we'd probably hauled off about 40 dump truck loads of trash away from the base that had been accumulating ever since the Air Force turned it over in uh, 1977 to the city of Wendover. So here's a, here's a picture before of one of the squadron operation buildings. There's the picture after we've worked on it. There's another squadron building. Now, this one hasn't been completely restored yet, but at least now is painted and stabilized. And here's a photo, and there's the historic photo of a of a group oops, of a a group of pilots, Bernard's crew. You notice they misplaced or misspelled Wendover, but it's Wendover 1943. There's a hallway prior to restoration. There's a hallway after we've restored the building. This is a briefing room in the squadron building. And this is a photo from the 509th composite group uh, where the guys are getting together and, and having a bit of a briefing. Again, the, the big, uh, big briefing hallway before and after our restoration. And to be clear, most of the buildings won't look like this. This one was fixed up a little nice to serve as the airport terminal, at least for a time for our casino charter flights. But you're not going to see this tile floor in all the buildings, though, of course, it fits and is accurate for the officers club and some other things. So this is a somewhat rendering. So again, our, our hope, our, our plans are uh, with a number of these buildings to to make them look even more World War II-ish with with appropriate signs and posters, period-looking chairs, lighting, and so forth. Hangar number five, mm -hmm. you probably remember driving down the flight line and looking at that, but that was. That's what it looked like when I when I first arrived, and uh, there it is again. We we're able to get one grant right there. You can see we got the roof on, and then working with the National Guard, there it is today. We've had to be kind of careful in in our restoration and be a little bit heavy-handed. Uh, when the guard was working with us, they wanted to put uh, I'm sure you've seen them, the typical fold up uh, accordion type hangar doors. And although this, this approach is much more expensive with the five doors on each side that all open up and slide into the, into the pockets, uh, with, with the help of the National Guard's restoration specialist, we were able to kind of convince them that yes, this is this is what we really want to do. It's got to look, got to look like it did originally. 
that's that's one of the buildings that uh, we have two buildings that we refer to as unrecoverable. And when I arrived, my advice was on that building, bring in the D8 cat and let's take care of that. Uh, but rather than do that, we wanted to, to preserve that historic building. And so now you see the result of what we did. Most of the buildings, when they were first uh, put up on the base, they put them up so fast that what they ended up doing is just putting tar paper and then a bunch of lath strips to hold the tar paper down. And so this particular building, that's what, that's what we did with that to show an example of how kind of how that works. The Norton bombsite storage vault, uh, prior to working on it, and there's a picture after, nicely painted, windows redone. We had a number of volunteer projects. Uh, this in particular is an Eagle Scout project uh, to work on the work on the windows in the interior. So you see the, the bank vault doors over on the right. And here's the here's the final result. Tom, do you want to guide us through this tour? Here it is. <laughs> this is it, it's basically an entrance, uh, and then this gives you an idea of what the what the entire space looks like, with uh, the repair tables and charts on the right, and then you know kind of a period picture of recreating what the what would have looked like in that building back up there. But that it, it's a unique building, probably less than half a dozen in that shape in the country. Um, we've uh, the the last thing to do really in this space is to fully restore some of those bank vault doors uh, to functional. But that's uh, this this building's pretty rare and pretty unique space uh, that, that would have really existed at every phase two training base in the country but after the war there just was no need so most of them were bulldozed uh, i think there's one in kansas that we've we've been able to share some pictures and stuff with that they're trying to restore but as far as other than that i think this is a probably like i said one of a one of a less than half a dozen Go ahead. And then back to that C-54 we mentioned. The reason why we wanted to acquire this is, first of all, it was already here in Wendover. It's kind of here for some long-term storage. Things fell through with that company. And as it sat, we kind of waited for a time where it was more reasonable to acquire it. And that did happen. So the reason the C-54 is so applicable is, is you look at this picture. That C-54 is here at Wendover, part of the 320th Troop Carrier Squadron of the 509th Composite Group. Um, so it's going to be restored to look like one of those five aircraft that the 320th Troop Carrier Squadron was flying here out of Wendover. This was the private air logistic support for the 509th in this atomic operation. So these would be found flying between places like Los Alamos and Wendover, moving around engineers, physicists, individuals necessary and working on bomb components and designs. And then these were flying pretty well round trips between the United States and Tinian Island as we geared up for the atomic missions, moving men and materials, including components of the little boy bomb. So ultimately this is gonna be restored and parked in our hangar for static display. You can see in this picture, one of our first restoration steps was to remove this big belly tank. Because for about the past 30 years, this flew fighting forest fires, and that's where it carried water and fire retardant. So now it's looking a little slimmer and 
much more World War II-esque. So we're excited to have that larger aircraft restoration. The, this is the one of uh, three atomic bomb loading pits on the base. Uh, this is kind of how it looked when we first came. That all that debris on the bottom is is actually just under two feet thick because it just had been blowing in there for the past 49 years or 50 or 60. Uh, we had an Eagle Scout project to clean that out and. Uh, so there it is, there it is cleaned out. You can see where we would have, we're, we're missing the hydraulic ram, the lift, but that's just a typical service station type lift. <clears throat> and this is where they would have set the bombs down inside the bomb pit. And then uh, back the B-29 over the top of the bomb pit, hydraulically push that bomb up in and latch it into the B-29. Since the bomb weighed five tons, uh, the internal winches just didn't never did work trying to pull those bombs up in. So that's why these pits were uh, basically conceived and, and uh, installed in Wendover. Uh, they modified them and improved them a little bit, but this is essentially the pit design that is now on Tinian, two pits there that loaded the final atomic bombs. <laughs> and the B-29 hangar, you can see again what it looked like prior to uh, doing anything with it. We did get, uh, we, we worked on trying to clean it out a little bit, but we did get a, a, a Save America's Treasure grant about a half million dollar grant, we had to match that with another half million <clears throat> and we're able to uh, stabilize it, get, get siding on, get new, get new windows in. Uh, there, there's still a great deal to be done. <clears throat> and we also were able to get this, uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation's 11 most endangered list in 2009. <laughs> That's a picture of the hallway. Uh, it was literally getting ready to fall off. We had it strapped to the to the main hangar with big truck straps to keep it from just tipping right over. And after the restoration, we got it straightened up and plumbed, and it's now ready for the next phase of walls and so forth. There's one of the upstairs rooms the before and after and in particular this was colonel paul tippett's office right here in this space we're looking at so that's one of those things as we continue to restore the hangar we want to preserve this and make it look period to remember that history so you can see how our windows looked before and after <clears throat> Here's the front door. It was really kind of just patched together over the years with various pieces of tin. And now the interesting, it's, the interesting thing on between those shots is we have a lot of people say, "Why did you ruin the beautiful patina on the?" <laughs> you kind of, you kind of have to uh, balance the old with what it should have been and how we can keep it standing. So. Gone is the beautiful shading. <laughs> but at least now it'll stand up. And here's a here's a photo of the interior. <clears throat> the plane on the left is a HU-16 Albatross. Uh, it came just slightly after the war. Didn't really see World War II uh, service. But again, the interior of this hangar is big enough that our ultimate objective is to, uh, if we were to find a B-29 that somebody would just go ahead and give us, we'd put the B-29 in there. Otherwise, we'll have to really fight for one. But uh, Although uh, Fifi has been in this hangar. 
a long time ago. We had a we had a reunion in 2001 for the 509th composite group, and they had about 85 veterans on the field. We had Fifi and the B29 Diamond Lil B24 that were that were there with us on the field. One of the one of the particular challenges of that building was the asbestos removal, because it, during the 40s that was the soup du jour for insulation and basically everywhere you see that's white was covered in uh, asbestos yeah so we actually had to take <clears throat> all of the metal off this building uh, along with the asbestos insulation and uh, of course double bag that up and take it to an appropriate landfill they then we then had to clean the girders off because the spray had been sprayed on the girders, so it was it was quite a task. Uh, ultimately, we're going to respray this with with a modern, more fire retardant insulation, and kind of get it back to its original uh, original configuration. Hopefully, it'll be a less carcinogenic process mm -hmm. nowadays. It's looking up. Just, just to give you an idea of our future plans for restoration, one of the things that we want to do is restore one of the celestial navigational trainer buildings. You can see a, a picture of that building on the left. <clears throat> there were four of those at Wendover. Uh, the building was about 45 feet tall. And if you look on the right, that's a picture from popular science that shows that black dome at the top, which actually uh, had stars painted on it. And then that black dome could move across, move on a track. So the, the navigator in his little compartment there could look up and <clears throat> yeah, there's his compartment. <laughs> he, he could look up and use his sextant to learn how to use the sextant and navigate by the stars. The projection on the bottom right here was for the bombardier to use his Norden bomb site in training how to do that, as that was a moving picture and he, he would uh, go across that. Our thought on this building <clears throat> is to have a regular planetarium dome about a 24 foot dome. We'd have seats for about uh, 26 people plus a couple handicapped, and they can sit there and we can uh, display a program on how to use the sextant. And since it's a full blown planetarium, we can show uh, earth sciences and space shows, uh, which is something that in our sort of remote area would be a real boon to the to the local population. <clears throat> One of our other projects we're working on right now is to restore the original base guard shack. Uh, amazingly enough, they kept this guard shack. They just kind of picked it up and took it over to a remote part in the base. Uh, there's where it is. <clears throat> our plan is to use that as a design, recreate that, and put it in front of the row of barracks. Uh, so the guard shack with a, with a typical type guard arm and have that be part of the, part of the experience. Uh, plus it'll be, it'll be a restoration of the original, uh, original base, base entry guard shack. <clears throat> One of the other projects is restoring uh, the latrine and shower building. When we have more barracks restored, of course, one thing that will be important is to, is to have the latrine. Typically, there was a column of five barracks, and then at the top of the column would be a shower and latrine. So uh, the guys in the close barracks got an easy walk to the, to the bathroom. The guys in the, the barracks farther south had a, had a much longer walk. But that's one of the projects that will make the base uh, more useful as far as having 
Civil Air Patrol groups, scout groups, uh, and actually just general visitors who want to have an overnight uh, stay in an original barracks on the base. And that's that kind of plays into as as we restore a base. It, it can't just be a static restoration. Uh, we have to be able to support it ongoing and, and through using it for CAP uh, activities and other ongoing activities that, that help produce revenue and are a benefit to others besides just the museum. That's, that's one of the crucial things as we look at these buildings is not only how do I restore this unique place but how do I restore this unique place and allow it to help kind of earn its keep, so to speak? And that's that's been uh, a good thing and a challenge all at the same time. So. <clears throat> this is the uh, this is the Airman's Dining Hall. Uh, here's a photo with <clears throat> with some Civil Air Patrol folks in here. Our objective on this, this faults, this uh, drop ceiling was put in years ago. Our objective will be to take that away back to the original kind of trust roof that, that you saw in the, in the officer's club. Uh, the floor there looks a lot better than it really is. So we've got to, got to re again, restore that floor and then uh, just do some basic work on it. It does need a does need a new roof, so so we're working on that. <clears throat> Just quickly, we had a a couple of years ago. We did a pilots camp with the Utah CAF. We had pilots come. They stayed in the original barracks. They had meals in the Airmen's Dining Hall. We did training sessions in the Officers Club in the B29 hangar. Uh, they did flight instruction, safety instruction. Uh, navigation. Um, the, our control tower is again is operational, so they could go up in that and get an idea of working the radio. The way this worked, we had <clears throat> two days of basic training in the PT-17. So the pilots got to fly all four days. Uh, the first two days in the in the steerman, and then the second two days uh, advancing to the T6. Um, we are, we're kind of in the process of working with the CAF. Incidentally, one of the things that we're finally getting finished in the B29 hangar is we're gonna have, uh, next year we're gonna have functional restrooms. So that's kind of a key, key element to using the hangar. But we think that this is a concept uh, as we know, this has been done in California uh, with the bomber camp, but this is something that uh, the, the pilots that attended this were, uh, in fact, a couple of them signed up for the next year, and then we had a had an airplane problem. But uh, uh, we see this as a as a really good potential, both for revenue and for using the base, and just having people be able to get a get an experience of, of being at Wendover. Well, and it, the other thing, the comments we had is it's, you know, whether, whether a, a family member trained in Wendover or, uh, you know, anywhere across the country, because it was the military experience and those, those who have served in the military, you know, hey, that's the same building in Texas or Oklahoma or somewhere. This Wendover allows people to come and really, oh, when grandpa says something about this in his diary or his letters, this is what he means. I get it now. Uh, and that's, that's a unique experience that we're able to provide to people who visit. And they, you know, whether it was actually, whether their ancestor was in Wendover or somewhere else, you, you, you get a feeling for, oh, I see what he means complaining about going to the latrine 
when it's five blocks away. So it's it, it's a unique experience that regardless if they were here or not, you, you get an idea of ah, that aha moment. Yeah, and whether it's pilot's camp or just visiting the base, we want this to be an immersive, I mean, really re recreation of what was here. Well, and finally, <clears throat> we've already talked about the B-29 hangar, <clears throat> but the things left to do, we need a sprinkler system, insulation, electrical, uh, some HVAC in there, uh, to at least keep the offices warm on the side, and then, of course, restore the offices and shops. And here is uh, here's part of the rendering of what we what we ultimately hope to hope to have the base look like. Uh, off to the right here, you can see the rows of barracks that are that are currently there. Right here in the middle, where my pointer is, is is the fire station, Norton bomb site, the restored uh, celestial navigation building. This long building was the link trainer building. Uh, this, uh, this is an admin building, and then a and then a storage building. So again, just a, a rendering of what we hope this to look like once we get a, a bunch of the barracks restored. <laughs> and that's historic Landover Airfield. Well, uh, there's, uh, there's been quite a lot that has uh, taken place uh, through the years. Uh, and we've got some questions from, from our audience members. Um, and But uh, when did this uh, the restoration start? Jim, when did, when did you first kind of get involved with this? Well, <clears throat> I got interested in the 509th Composite Group and went to a reunion in 2000 in Kansas City. And while we were at that reunion, the, the veterans said, we're tired of planning these things. Who wants to, who, who could put on a reunion? So another gentleman, Robert Krauss uh, and I said, well, we'll do one in Wendover. So in 2001 is when they showed up and uh, things weren't really restored then, but we've kind of fixed it up enough that they could come. So, uh, and then I, I took over as uh, airport director here at Wendover in uh, late 2002, 2003. And that's really when we started chipping away at the restoration, the, the foundation was formed then. It took us several years to, to get enough funds to really get going on it. But th this effort's essentially been going on since the early 2000s. And for those who are not, uh, don't don't have the, the geography in mind. Explain exactly where Wendover is. This is, um, as you mentioned, kind of a remote area, but that uh, played into, uh, especially the the B twenty nine and the Manhattan Project, the secrecy there, but uh, also the weather conditions there, um, kind of helped uh, build the base as well. It's Wendover has the distinction of having uh, about three hundred flyable VFR days. Uh, some of those days can get a little windy, uh, but basically if you're looking at a map and you go about 90 miles straight west of Salt Lake City, uh, right out to the Utah-Nevada border, that's geographically, that's, that's where Wendover is. If you go, I, I'm not sure it's exactly straight east of, of Reno, but roughly straight east of Reno to the if you're, you know, coming from the west, that gives you a good idea. And it's, it, it's, it's a great place for a training base because you have a long, long level flat approach to, uh, to the runways, and um, it, it's just, it's a really good, much better than what originally was. Salt Lake International was a training field uh, with a large population right next door. Uh, Wendover made a far better place for a training field. And really, if you, for those of you that are race fans, the Wendover Air Base is right next to the Bonneville 
uh, South Flats racetrack. So it's all part of this old flat uh, salt bed that was once Lake Bonneville. About uh, how many, at, in its heyday, uh, how many uh, servicemen were stationed at, at Wendover? At, a, at its very peak, just under 20, thought, well, there were <clears throat> about 17,000 military and 2,500 civilians. And, and the base, the bombing and gunnery range was 1.8 million acres. So <clears throat> what remains is, uh, is about 2,200 acres that we currently have on the airfield. 1.3 million of those acres are now the live fire Utah test and training range, which is the, uh, the Air Force's largest supersonic live fire range in the country. And uh, Jim, as, as airport manager, this is not just the, the uh, historic Wendover Field, but it's an, it's an operating airport today, right? Oh yeah, yeah, it's an operating airport. Actually, due to the pandemic, we've kind of stopped that for the minute, but the casinos had a, a gaming charter flight that went to about 70 different cities and we brought about 55,000 people a year into Wendover on, on 737s. But today we can land almost anything. Actually, the military uses this uh, quite a bit. We've had uh, C-17s in here uh, taking part in operations and carting people in and out. We have helicopters stopping by on a regular basis. So the military still uh, uses the field. It's a nice 10,000 foot uh, runway. So we are a backup emergency field for the jets out of Hill Air Force Base that use the Utah Test and Training Range. Uh, any thoughts as to when those uh, casino charters might restart? We're hoping tomorrow. <laughs> no, we there's I think they're still struggling with uh, with the, the kind of the change in economic conditions, and we're not sure. All right, as you uh, sort of got got into restoring the buildings, uh, one of our our viewers wants to know uh, how do you decide what colors to paint things? <laughs> well, uh, one of the things, like for the hangers, the white it was just white. <laughs> so so that was pretty easy. That green, that green that's in the squadron buildings. See, amazingly enough, most of these buildings, when the Air Force left, they just left. And and a lot of the buildings had not been used. And so um, we we just went in and found the colors that were there and we matched those matched those colors. Well, and we we do have the advantage in Wendover of, and and it's it's really kind of amazing to me, given what usually happens with that kind of record, we have the original uh, building drawings, uh, and a lot of that the paint is actually called out on some of those drawings, uh, which which truthfully would have been typical across the country, but. We, we did have that advantage of of having this repository of original drawings, architectural drawings. Um, as and as you were showing the the, the paint, we, we went back to the uh, the Norton bomb site uh, building, and that one, uh, according to Leah, who's watching the the comments on on Facebook and YouTube, uh, that building got got. Uh, Quite a bit of interest as, as folks wanted to know exactly what was what were the secret things that were inside the vault but that was uh when you look at those the, the different vault doors that's where they they kept the northern bomb sites correct yeah, yeah go ahead yeah so they were such a top secret device i mean worldwide they were probably the most advanced bomb site we had so those were what was in the nose of those aircraft the plexiglass so the bomber deer sitting there looking miles out ahead of his target and that's helping calculate his trajectory from high altitude, intaking things like altitude, airspeed, wind drift, and more, 
actually connects to the aircraft's autopilot and helps steer it on the last leg of the run. So for that time, I mean, that's absolutely incredible. They had accuracy claims that were not so true, like you often hear dropping a bomb in a pickle barrel, but for the time, they were incredibly accurate. So to protect that top secret device, you would have found vaults similar to this at any Army Air Base where those were being used. And when a bombardier finished a mission, he physically removed that device from the aircraft and he'd bring it back to this secure building, had a barbed wire fence, an armed guard, and it was maintained in this space and locked in one of these five vaults. So they took that security very seriously. And interestingly, for that building in the video, you see it kind of walk through a room and there's a big engine sitting there on the ground. Uh, this was the only building on base that had its very own dedicated uh, emergency power source. And that was to keep the, you know, we say air conditioning and really it's just keeping the fan blowing a constant flow of air. But, but yeah, this building had its very own dedicated emergency power source be, to keep these Norden sites uh, in a climate controlled uh, environment. And it's, and we're actually having that engine restored. So someday uh, you'll be able to come out, we can fire that monster up, and <laughs> make a lot of noise. I, I was uh, just looking at it. It looks like it would, it would make some noise. Um, let's see. Right. Maybe uh, if any of you have any uh, of the uh, iconic stories that, that kind of um, really represent what Wendover was uh, during World War II, any, any stories that sort of stand out to any of you? I think the, because we're here in the picture, um, one, of the, one of the things that stands out to me was, and, and I, Jim can correct me on her name, uh, Thomas Costa, who was a bombardier with the 509th, um, was, was able to come to the 2001 reunion prior to this building being restored. And then after the building had been restored uh, in, I think it was, when was that second 509th reunion? Just a few years ago. 2015. Yeah, 2015, his daughter came and and as she came to this building and and really it during the war the bombardier wouldn't have come any further than that very first little uh you know it's maybe what 20 square feet alcove and and he would have been handed that but as she stood there she she just kind of looked around and 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 uh, turned to us and said thank you for restoring this because my daddy stood here and and you just think you know as you look back and think about trying to figure out is the paint right um why is this window here maybe we should take the window out uh getting those things just right to have somebody turn to you and with tears in their eyes just say this may this is all worth it this tiny little building that really doesn't make sense to a lot of people until they come and and learn about it. That's to me as far as the restoration. Um, the, that's one of the aha worth it moments. And then I'll hog a little bit on the on the for the 2001 reunion. Those doors on that B29 hangar had not been opened in years. And uh, somebody said, you know what would be great is if we could get Fifi in there. And so a bunch of these National Guardsmen and myself said, well, we can open these doors. And so we kind of pried them open and started to push. And as we pushed those huge sliding doors, there may have been a few pigeons nests on top of that door. And we were, you know, we were just pushing this door open and somebody said, look out below. And uh, this guardsman and myself and a couple other guys were just covered in 
<clears throat> pigeon manure and nesting material. And we just kind of stood there, kind of the classic covered in white dust. And the one guy, the one guardsman looked at me and he goes, sir, this is why you never volunteer for anything. <laughs> I saw, yeah, we were, to me, those are the two things that stand out. How about you, Jim or Landon? Any, any stories that, that uh, strike you? Well, from a, from a security standpoint, again, in the 2001 reunion, um, we took some pilots out to that atomic bomb loading pit and the pilot said, this is the first time we've ever seen this. We weren't allowed to come out here. Uh, that project was so secret and so compartmentalized that uh, it, there was a special crew that loaded the bombs and then took the planes up to uh, where the pilots took over and they, <laughs> they, they had never seen it. Uh, we also, on, on later reunions, uh, or we've had people come on the base and say, I was born in the hospital here in Wendover. And that's, uh, that, that's kind of interesting. We, we have a group right now, Barracks 2503. They traced back their dad, uh, or grandfather, uh, anyway. Anyway, they traced him back and they have a photo of him by barracks 2503. And so he said, when you restore that barracks, we're gonna bring a crew of 15 people out here and, and we'll help you with that barracks because we, we have a photo of our dad at that barracks. So that, that's kind of interesting. Indeed, and if, Today, if if someone wants to to visit, how do they? Is the are you open? You know, during the week and weekends, uh, how do people visit? We're open currently Tuesdays through Saturdays, Tuesdays eleven to four, and Saturdays ten to five. If you want to see more of the base, almost every day we offer a tour at one thirty. So for about an hour, we take you down the flight line into a couple of those hangars, out to the atomic bomb loading pit, the fire station, the bomb site building. So you have a better chance to actually walk through more of this history, make it a bit more accessible. Um, and there is uh, <clears throat> the current fixed base operator, the FBO, there, there are a number of artifacts, uh, World War II artifacts, and that building's actually open eight to six, seven days a week. So there are a number of signs on the base that whether we're open or not, they can drive around the base see the signs that explain what went on at various locations. Right, well, we were uh, closed, um, we also have a mobile app. So if you come down, there are various tours you can take and you can pull up historic images and current images. So even if you can't access some of the buildings, there's still a lot of that content available. So you can take a tour kind of like you saw today. And, and for you pilots, Wendover is the ultimate $100 hamburger stop. That's, you fly in, catch a ride up to the casino. We actually, the airport courtesy car uh, is a Crown Victoria that has been painted uh, flat OD with stars and bars. So you, you are welcome to fly in and, and uh, have a real time. <laughs> I think I think the Crown Vic is is the the courtesy car of so many airports <laughs> around the around the country. You see them everywhere. Uh, uh, if, so if when, helps, when we got it, we thought, "Why now? We got to do something special here." <laughs> there you go. Um, and if if people want to be uh, more involved, want to support the efforts, either uh, by volunteering or through financial uh, contributions, how do they how do they get a hold of you and and uh, support the efforts there? wendoverairfield.org wendoverairbase.org same name will be changing so yeah. either we'll get you there yeah that's right we're also on social media facebook instagram and we also are running some TikTok. so feel free to watch some videos there but you're welcome to reach out to us at any of those platforms and ask for more information yeah, and I, I have to admit, TikTok is where I, I found it. Uh, Landon, watching uh, your videos and uh, seeing your enthusiasm and excitement for for what was going on, just uh, wanted me to 
to cause me to want to learn more about uh, what's going on out there. So uh, exciting times and uh, gentlemen, I appreciate you uh, taking time to uh, to share your your current uh, uh, progress and some of your future plans. Any any final thoughts before we sign off tonight? No, we just appreciate the opportunity to uh, spread the word. And come on uh, out and see us. Uh, All right, sounds good. Thank you to everybody. <laughs> And uh, thank you for uh, all of you for uh, joining us tonight for our uh, Warbird Tube webinar. If you have any suggestions for any uh, future topics or someone you think we should uh, talk to and would, would be of interest, just drop Leah Block an uh, email at uh, media at cafhq.org. We'll be back Wednesday night, uh, next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, for another edition of our Warbird Tube webinar. Thanks to uh, Landon, uh, Jim, and uh, Tom for uh, telling us more about the historic Wendover Field. And until next week, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night. <laughs>